All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Round. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Niaz Ali, one of our third-year pediatric residents. Uh, Dr. Ali uh, came to us from Hawler Medical University in northern Iraq. She worked. She practiced rural medicine and worked as a house officer there for a few years prior to this moving to Morganton, West Virginia, where she worked as a research assistant prior to residency. During her time here at Carillion, uh, she has participated in a QI project involving screening for social determinants of health as part of the Seek or Safe Environment for Every Kid program. Please join me in welcoming today's presenter, Dr. Nina Ali. Thank you, Dr. Permeshwar, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us um, today for the ground round. Uh, I'm going to talk about infantile hemangioma today, and I picked this topic because we don't see it that often, and I wanted to learn more about it. And, of course, I don't have any disclosure. Um, so my objectives for today, hopefully by the end of the presentation, you will be able to differentiate uh, hemangiomas from other vascular anomalies and malformation. Uh, I will be talking about pattern and presentation of hemangiomas and the current uh, management. Um, so here is the outline of my slides. All right, so it's really important whenever you have a baby with um, cutaneous or vascular cutaneous birthmark to give that lesion a name and put it in uh, a, a category and give the right terminology uh, to avoid confusion and misdiagnosis. As we all know, whenever we give a diagnosis, the parents will go and uh, search it search the term and search the uh, treatment for that condition. Um, so it's really important to familiarize ourselves with a cutaneous vascular lesion, uh, which basically divided into two major groups, uh, vascular neoplasm and vascular malformation. As I said, it's important to know about this condition because it's common. We have seen it in our in babies that we take care of. Um, and usually those lesions are benign. Uh, it comes as isolated finding, or it will be part of more uh, complex congenital disease or syndrome. So what does vascular tumors include? Uh, it involves um, infantile hemangioma, which I will be spending uh, a lot of time talking about it today. It includes uh, congenital hemangiomas. Now, congenital hemangiomas are different than infantile. Those babies, they will have fully formed hemangioma at birth and uh, divided into two uh, categories, either uh, rapidly involuting or rich and then involuting lesion or niche. The other types of uh, vascular tumor is lobulated capillary hemangioma or pyogenic granuloma. Now, this lesion appears during infancy or sometimes uh, when in toddler, uh, and this type of lesion, they prone for uh, recurrent bleeding um, because there is a lot of vascularity in that lesion. Other types of vascular tumors uh, that are not that common involve tufted and uh, certain types of sarcoma. Now, what is vascular malformation? Basically, it's anomalies of the blood vessels. Uh, it includes venous lymphatic capillary, or you could have mixed lesion and AV malformation. All right, as you see from uh, this slide, we have many multiple pictures of vascular lesion, cutaneous <coughs> vascular lesion. As you could see, infantile hemangioma is different than tufted angioma. With infantile hemangioma, the lesion is raised and appears like plaques. While the baby, the newborn baby, has fully formed uh, lesion at birth, and as you could see from pyogenic granuloma, the lesion is lobulated, uh, and the last one, that baby with big lesion on the neck, which is uh, lymphatic malformation. All right, just a quick review on vascular malformation. 
So as you see from the uh, first picture, this is uh, a baby with capillary malformation. The lesion appears as pink, uh, red, smooth. They usually present at birth, and sometimes some of the, the lesion may d uh, fade and disappear within the first few years of life. Uh, for example, nevus simplex. And the other type is lymphatic. As you see, that baby with giant uh, uh, mass on the neck. Uh, this condition is usually benign, and it divided into either macrocystic or microcystic. Uh, as you could see from the next uh, the picture, it has multiple uh, tiny lesions. All right, so it's important to know about venous malformation. Uh, so that lesion appears as uh, bluish, ill-defined nodules or masses. You could see it on the skin, uh, mucous surface, or even on the internal organs. Uh, now, why we need to know about that? Because those, uh, the larger lesion, they prone to um, consump consumption of the platelets and coagulation factor that may lead to bleeding and thrombosis. And the last one is AV malformation. Now those lesions appear as purplish, uh, red, uh, and the lesion is usually painful. They may ulcerate and bleed. All right, so I wanted to talk briefly about Casabac Merit phenomena. Uh, because we don't see that condition or phenomena that often. It's not common, but it's, when it happens, it's a life-threatening condition. Uh, it happens in babies with Kaposi-form hemangioendothelioma and tufted angioma. Now, those babies uh, with this type of uh, vascular lesion, they, they do consumption of the platelets and coagulation factor that may lead to DIC. And those babies, they need more aggressive treatment uh, than the, the the regular type of infantile hemangioma. All right, now I'm going to talk about infantile hemangiomas. Um, and there are certain key uh, points we need to remember uh, about infantile hemangiomas. It is common. Um, we see it. And I believe the incidence rate in general population about uh, 4 to 5 percent. Uh, and it's the most common tumor uh, during infancy. It's more common in female than male, uh, and we don't know why. Uh, there is certain risk factor that puts you at risk for developing infantile hemangioma. Uh, the number one risk factor is low birth weight, uh, and there's other risk factor includes being female, uh, Caucasian ethnicity, uh, firstborn baby, a multiple gestation pregnancy, bridge presentation, and there's also maternal risk factor, which includes older maternal age, uh, placenta previa, and using certain medication uh, like fertility drug or uh, erythropoietin. All right, so now why hemangiomas happen in certain babies and not in other babies? Um, so there is multiple studies being done, um, and it showed hypoxemia is the key point or the trigger for developing um, infantile hemangioma. So whenever there is intrauterine hypoxemia, that triggers or stimulates certain factors that leads to develop angiogenesis, and those factors involve hypoxemia, inducible factor 1-alpha, vascular endothelial growth factor, glu glucose transporter isoform, and insulin-like growth factor 2. So it's really, really important to know the natural history and behavior of infantile hemangioma, especially when you talk to the parents and when you counsel them. So uh, infantile hemangioma, uh, they have two uh, phases. They have a growth phase or proliferation phase and involution phase. Um, now, sometimes infantile hemangioma can be misdiagnosed uh, during birth. So during birth, the lesions really settle. You don't see it a lot, uh, and sometimes could misdiagnose as bruises. Um, so the growth phase happens before four weeks of age and usually complete uh, the growth by five months of age, uh, while involution phase happens <clears throat> after 12 months of age and usually complete involution by age four years. 
Now, when we say involution, that doesn't mean that the lesion will disappear completely. Sometimes it will leave a scar, sometimes hemangioma, or sometimes fibro, um, fibro fatty tissue. All right, so it is important to know about classification of hemangioma because that affects the way you treat it. And not all hemangiomas are the same. It's really important to know, okay, so that lesion um, located with this surface area with the skin or and how we, it's important to know how much area is covering. So classically, it divided into or classified into superficial or deep or sometimes mixed. As you could see from the picture that they be, you could see the lesion with the uh, skin surface, while the picture B, you don't see it, uh, the lesion with the uh, skin surface, but you could uh, notice that bluish um, discoloration. And picture C, it has component of both. Um, so previously, superficial hemangioma uh, termed as um, strawberry or capillary hemangioma. Now those terms are outdated and we don't use it anymore. And the other classification is the uh, where where is the lesion located? Is it focal or local or is it multifocal or segmental? Now uh, superficial hemangiomas it appears early and usually it uh, involutes early and uh, sometimes it wouldn't leave any uh, scar. All right, so as I said, it's important to know the location and classification because it affects the management. So I'm going to spend some time about uh, certain um, hemangiom infantile hemangiomas, um, so periorbital hemangiomas, those type of infantile hemangiomas that uh, appears around the eyes. Um, and so those lesion, they put the baby at risk for uh, visual impairment. So they may uh, compress on the globes, they may uh, sometimes extend to the retroorbital spaces and lead to uh, vision changes like strabismus and ambilopia. So early referral to ophthalmology is, um, is required in babies with these lesions. All right, so segmental hemangioma, this type of hemangioma involves large surface area. Um, so as you see from the picture, it could appear on segment one or frontal temporal, segment two, segment three, or four. And it's really important um, to rule out certain syndromes that um, could uh, appear with this type of infantile hemangioma. So whenever we have a lesion uh, or segmental hemangioma on the face, on the neck, it's really important to uh, rule out face syndrome, which I will be uh, spend some time talking about. Uh, and also, whenever we have um, a hemangioma on the lower part of the body, it's important to rule out lumbar syndrome. All right, so what is face syndrome? Um, it is babies who have infantile hemangioma, uh, specifically segmental type, uh, which is more than five centimeters that uh, appears on the face, scalp, uh, posterior head and neck. Uh, the acronym for this syndrome is posterior foster anomalies. Uh, so those babies may have a, a genesis of the cerebellum or dandy walker or other certain um, uh, anomalies of the brain. Um, they may have hemangioma. They will have arterial anomalies, cardiac malformation, specifically correctation of aorta, and they also may have um, eyes anomaly. So it's really important to involve more than subspecialties to take care of this baby because they are at risk for developmental delay, seizure, and even stroke. All right. Uh, while lumbar syndrome is a lower body segmental infant, uh, infantile hemangioma, so the acronym for that syndrome is lipoma and uh, or hemangioma. They will have urogenital myelopathy, bone uh, deformity, arterial anomalies, and renal anomalies. So beard distribution in infantile hemangioma is really, really important to uh, to be familiar with this uh, condition because those babies who have segmental hemangioma on the cervical facial or beard distribution area, uh, they are at risk for airway compromise. Um, and if it could be so severe that the, uh, the baby will end up uh, having tracheostomy, but usually it's not that severe. Uh, those babies also at risk for having um, 
feeding issues, speech issues. So early referral to ENT is required in babies with their distribution infantile hemangioma. So what about multiple hemangiomas? Whenever we have a baby with uh, five or more than um, five infantile uh, small hemangioma, it's really important to rule out internal organs hemangioma. Uh, now, liver is the most common site to have um, um, hemangiomas, so um, uh, ultrasound is your uh, guide to rule out uh, hepatic hemangioma. Now, I found it really interesting that babies with uh, hepatic hemangioma, they are at risk for having hypothyroidism. Uh, because the liver will uh, the liver will produce a thyroid deactivation enzyme, which leads to conception of the thyroid hormone, and those babies also at risk for having hepatomegaly and even um, heart failure. All right, so complication of hemangioma. I kind of talked about certain complication. Um, so segmental infantile hematoma are at risk for having complication more than focal because they involve larger surface area. Um, facial infantile hematoma cause more complication because babies are curious, they may touch it, they may start having ulceration and bleeding. Usually bleeding is minor um, and is not significant. You could stop it with a simple pressure. Uh, we talked about beer distribution, how it affects airway and periorbital and hepatic. Right, so how do you diagnose uh, infantile hemangioma? Basically, you do history and physical exam. It's really important to, whenever you take history, ask about where, when was the lesion first noted and how was the behavior afterwards, if there's any complication, what have been done for that baby, and did that baby receive treatment or not. Uh, and on physical exam, it's really important to do extensive exam of skin and mucous membrane and document the lesion location, morphology, and even uh, the size. And also it's important to look if there's any uh, complication like secondary infection or ulceration. And don't forget to palpate the liver for hepatomegaly, especially in babies for with more than uh, five uh, infantile hemangiomas. Now, we don't usually often do imaging in babies with infantile hemangioma, but there's certain condition, uh, as I mentioned before, face and uh, lumbar syndrome, you have to do uh, imaging to rule out there's any CNS abnormality or genitourinary abnormalities or even spinal cord abnormalities. Now, if you are suspicious about malignancy and you notice that the lesion is firm, um, rapid enlargement, you do your uh, imaging. Uh, also, sometimes we could do imaging if there is any complication or to see if the lesion is responding to therapy or not, especially in hepatic hemangiomas. So treatment. So the, oh, the goal for treatment, we should always aim for prevention um, or reverse if there's any life-threatening uh, complication or condition, we should always aim uh, to minimize disfigurement from the residual changes. And uh, don't forget about the psychosocial distress for the patient and the family. Um, and we, we should always aim for treatment of ulceration, minimize scarring, and don't forget about the pain part of the um, complication. All right, so there is really no um, a specific uh, algorithm or guideline for uh, infantile hemangioma treatment, but there is certain factors that could help you um, to gu uh, and guide you the treatment option. And those factors include uh, age of the patient, how fast the lesion is growing, uh, the size and location, also um, the degree of involvement and uh, complication, if there's any psychosocial consequences, and what is the parent's uh, preference, which is really important for uh, the treatment. And uh, of course, physician experience is important as well. All right. So treatment, so if you have a baby with small uh, superficial lesion like the pictures, um, watchful waiting is an option, specifically if the parents 
prefer not to do any uh, medical therapy, but it's really important to take serial photograph of the lesion to monitor uh, the involution process and outcome. Um, but if the parents prefer to do treatment, then you have certain local um, medical therapy, which is beta blocker, uh, steroid, and imiquimod. Now, how um, we end up using um, a topical beta blocker? As we all know, uh, the propranolol or systemic beta blocker has been used um, as a systemic therapy for infantile hemangioma, that, and which leads to uh, doing studies uh, to see how uh, if how if how good is topical beta blocker for infantile hemangiomas. But studies still uh, are limited. All right, so we could use topical beta blocker for small superficial lesion, and sometimes if uh, there is ulceration as well, we could use it. Um, we could also use it to prevent rebound growth in babies who have been tapered off propranolol. Um, as you could see from the picture, that baby with small um, non-ulcerated lesion had been treated with a topical beta blocker. Uh, there is some improvement. Uh, the lesion is not completely gone, but you could see some improvement uh, of the infantile hemangioma. Now, steroid. Steroid had been used uh, previously um, for small, superficial, or even isolated uh, lesion, but because of timolol, it's not has been using uh, that often uh, because of the side effects uh, of steroid, even the topical side effects you could have. Um, some. Now, intralesion uh, steroid have been used uh, as well for a uh, small, well localized, and or sometimes even deep hemangioma. Um, Imiquimod, so it is a topical immune response modifier. Uh, it has apoptotic properties. Now, we don't have randomized clinical uh, trial, um, and the studies, the observational studies and case report are conflicting, so we need more data to uh, start doing this therapy for infantile hemangioma. So what about if we have a complicated um, hemangioma or segmental hemangioma, and then at that time we'll start thinking of doing uh, systemic therapy. The first line is propranolol, uh, as we all know, it's non-selective beta blocker. Um, so the idea of propranolol and how it has been used for infantile hemangioma, so that's been uh, discovered by a French physician when he was taking care of baby with heart condition. Uh, the baby um, has infantile hemangioma as well. So the phys physician noticed changes in the size um, and color on, of infantile hemangioma while the baby was on uh, beta blocker. So that leads to more observational studies. Um, so in 2014, US FDA approved uh, propranolol hydrochloride for treatment of infantile hemangiomas in babies. Uh, so how does that work? Uh, so propranolol leads to vasoconstriction. Uh, they decrease expression of vascular endothelial growth factor and fibroblast growth factor, uh, which leads to apoptosis. Um, now other beta blocker um, could use as well, like nodazole and atenolol. There's small uh, study trials, uh, and those beta blocker has less side effects than propranolol. Now it's really important to do your uh, pre-assessment uh, before starting beta, blo uh, beta blocker, uh, and your history should focus on uh, respiratory system and cardiovascular system. So you need to rule out uh, bradycardia in the baby uh, and ask about if there's any um, heart condition in the family, and specifically bradycardia. Uh, now, you don't have to send to cardiology uh, if the baby is otherwise healthy, you no know, issues with feeding. Um, but if the baby is having any heart condition or the baby is preterm or premature, you should involve cardiology um, as well. Usually, hematology um, take care of 
um, of the babies with infantile hemangiomas and beta blocker. Now, it's important to be familiar with the side effects um, and, to, and tell the family about the common side effects, with in, which include sleep disturbance and discoloration uh, with cooling of the hands and feet. Uh, basically, that happens due to vasoconstruction. And it's really important to uh, to counsel the family um, about hypoglycemia symptom. As we all know, beta blocker, um, they, they block the hypoglycemia symptom or they mask it. Uh, so the important thing to tell the family to give propranolol either during feeds or after feeds to avoid hypoglycemia. And also tell them to hold and not give uh, propranolol whenever the baby is sick or not taking enough PO. Um, and you also need to know about contraindication of beta blocker, which includes shock, uh, heart blocks, uh, heart failure, uh, asthma, or, of course, allergies to beta blocker. All right, so as you can see from these two pictures, the first baby with the periorbital hemangioma, uh, you see improvement of the lesion after starting uh, Propranolol and almost the lesion is almost gone. Um, while the other baby with segmental hemangioma, you can see improvement. The lesion is still there, but there is a big change and improvement. All right. So, second line of therapy. The stimming steroid has been used uh, for treatment of infantile hemangioma before, but that has been replaced by um, beta blocker. Uh, since we start using beta blocker, uh, and of course we don't like the side effects of uh, steroid. Um, now, if there is any contraindication to beta blocker, um, we don't have any option uh, other than using steroid. Uh, and they have been doing studies to see how uh, effective is steroid compared to beta blocker. So they they know that both uh, therapies uh, were effective uh, more than 90 percent. So we have we always have alternative uh, therapies uh, whenever the steroid or um, beta blocker are contraindicated. Uh, we have vincristine, interferon, and we have surgery and um, laser. So for complicated hemangioma or when the uh, propranolol or systemic steroid are contraindicated or the hemangioma is really aggressive. Uh, we could always use vincristine. Now, vincristine has been used for treatment of Casabac merit phenomena. Um, so the other option is interferon alpha, which is a very potent inhibitor of angiogenesis that has been used for treatment of aggressive hemangioma. Now, when do we decide um, that baby needs laser or pulse dye laser? If we have, if the baby is having small, um, thin superficial hemangiomas that is in a growth phase, um, he can get benefit uh, from doing laser therapy. And sometimes we could use laser for if there's any ulceration of the uh, infantile hemangioma or the baby received treatment, but there is. Um, post-treatment erythema or telangiectasium. Now surgery. So we don't do surgery um, that often, but there are certain um, conditions we may send for uh, surgery. And those uh, conditions include uh, whenever there's failure or contraindication to uh, medical therapy or if the uh, lesion in the in the area or in the region that favorable for resection, or after involution, if there is um, like fibro fatty tissue, or there's excess skin or scar, or um, if there's damaged structure and we need to reconstruct that damaged structure. Now we usually um, prefer having surgical intervention after age four uh, because the involution uh, process has. Uh, completed at that age. Now the last uh, option is do embolization, and we don't usually do that often. That it's been used for um, hepatic hemangioma, and the result from that option is uh, temporary. 
So how do we take care of babies with ulcerated infantile hemangiomas? Um, so basically your goal um, should minimize the pain uh, because infantile hemangioma by itself is not painful, but when there is complication like ulceration, uh, babies could have pain. Um, and you do uh, dressing uh, with Vaseline, a lot of Vaseline, um, and also we need to control the growth of the infantile hemangioma by giving systemic therapy, uh, and sometimes we could do uh, laser as well. All right. So I have two questions for you. Um, I could read a question or you could read it. I will read the question. So we have three month old infant that has been seen for a bump on the upper eyelid. Um, mother first noticed the area of redness on the eyelid three weeks ago, uh, which has progressively become darker and now red and firm. The infant was born at term without any complication and has been growing appropriately and has no any other symptoms. She is alert and has normal tone and neurological examination. There is a red, well demarcated raised plaque on the upper eyelid, which is causing mild ptosis. Now pupils are round, equal, and reactive to light with normal red reflex. Um, Extraocular movements are intact. All the following. The most likely diagnosis is A, infantile hemangioma, B, congenital hemangioma, C, orbital lymphangioma, or D, rhabdomyosarcoma. That should be easy. Yes, yeah, so I see Andrew Hayes and Lark, they say it's A. Yes, so the right answer is A. Another question. So we have a three-month-old female infant is seen for multiple bumps on her abdomen. Her mother first noticed there was bumps two weeks ago, which has progressively become darker and bigger. The infant was born at them without complication, has been growing appropriately, and has no other symptoms. She's alert and has normal tone and your exam. Abdomen is soft without mass. There's 10 red, well-demarcated raised nodules on the abdomen. What is the best next step? Is it A, reassurance, no intervention, lift the baby. B, refer to dermatology. C, do ultrasound. D, to see the abdomen. Yes, yes, so the right answer is to see the abdomen to check the liver. Oh, I, I guess you guys learned a lot. You are giving the right answer. All right, so here is my reference. And thank you. I'm open for questions. Yeah, so Dr. Premish was asking, do we recommend dermatology referral um, for all? So it, it depends on your comfort and level to take care of the babies with um infantile hemangioma. If it's the, the lesion is small and superficial um, and the parents prefer not to do anything about it, so you don't have to, to do a referral dermatology. Uh, but if they want to do treatment and they want to start beta blocker or other therapies uh, or the, if there's complication at that time, we do refer to dermatology. So Dr. Kreider, yeah, that, thank you Dr. Kreider for sharing that. Um, so she says King's daughter has a great vascular breast mark clinic that I use on uh, the really complicated ones. Yeah, so the recommended, 
mission is to involve um, vascular anomalies team, uh, and I don't think we have it here in our area. Maybe well, that's a good idea, King's daughter. Uh, yeah. Thanks for sharing. I didn't know that, Doctor Greta. Um, Let's see. Oh, so Dr. Perushwa wants to to see the classification. So basically, it depends on the um, location um, and where it sits from the skin surface. You could have superficial deep uh, or mix, or you could have focal, multifocal, or segmental um, infantile hemangioma. So that's a new classification, Dr. Perushwa. Um, 